What I'm trying to find the thing you sent me you were so excited about. Oh I yeah. Texted I texted to you. The Carlin thing. George Carlin thing. Yeah. What was that about? You were so excited. Dude, the where he did a bunch of research um and uh, basically the word indian um in english actually d doesn't isn't referencing india um because the the it wasn't called india when uh when columbus arrived here it was called hindustan and so the it wasn't there was no reason for him to say oh we've we landed in India. We're going to name these people Indians, but that the word India doesn't show up until later, uh, and Indian shows up first. So uh, the a uh, uh, linguist went looking to figure out what where does it come from, and it comes from a letter that Columbus wrote to uh, back to the queen saying um that that these people we found these people and they are made in god's image in dios and as and people in god's image deserve our protection and they're not going to get it um it, they're, they're not going to be able to withstand the technological difference between europe um, and if if bad actors show up with the guns with with what they have, uh, actually wouldn't have been would it have been guns yet? It would have been cannons, not not handguns yet. But with gunpowder and oh, what pistols, wouldn't they? Uh, they might have had pistols. Yeah, I'd I'd have to look to see exactly when those sorts of things started to be carried on an, on a ship, that sort of thing. But the um, he, he says the there's a such a major difference between the technological uh, state of their society and ours that if we don't begin protecting them right away, they're going to be taken advantage of by bad, bad actors by, um, you know, Europeans that, that don't see them as in Dios, right. Um, that don't see God, God's image in them, aren't going to treat them well because they'll be so easy to take advantage of. And, so the word Indian actually comes from being made in the image of God. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so George Carlin, I, I mean, that's, that's, I, I was trying to track down the actual thing, the, the study that he was referencing, the, the linguistic study he was referencing um, and haven't, haven't been able to find it, but that was his explanation. And so he, he just said um, he was, and I was thinking how it's, um, and so then I'm, my question is, I wonder if the name India actually comes from our, um, from, from the people that Columbus ran into in the Caribbean here being called Indians, and then they ended up calling it India, or I don't know, I don't know where the, where India comes from, but Columbus called India, um, Hindu, Hindustan. So, um, <laughs> So uh, I just was thinking, man, I wonder um, what other just common knowledge things like that um, aren't true. And and so um, yeah. the, the, the text said, this is what radicalizes people. That question, you start to say, oh, dang, that was just made up. I wonder what else there was it, as a way of insulting Columbus, right, of insulting um the, so as a, and the reason that you want to retell the stories about the heroes of a people is because you want to reframe their moral compass you if you don't you go in and you start trying to tear down the heroes of a people uh, and the marxists this is part of what they say their plan is this is how they do things you get rid of the the heroes you got, start attacking the heroes there's a uh, a a really interesting lecture uh, that where it's a guy that he's reading through 
what the it um what the marxist marxists were passing out in the 40s um and he's saying we're going to start using the word fascist to describe anyone that's an enemy of the the revolution because that he says because that word has a smell and and people don't know the definition and so we can attach the smell of that word to pe without ever pe people won't be able to say wait but that's not what fascism is we'll just be able to use that to attach the smell then they talks about how they're going to go after the retell the story of every hero and to show that there's no there's no heroes for this people and a people that don't have heroes will be a people that that shift their focus on we need to we need to change this place because it's not producing good people right um, we're the bad guys in the story so we better get on the right side of history so th those sorts of things um when you just when you find something um that's just common knowledge that's not true it really has it, the it has the, that's how people start to get radicalized that's the beginning of the radicalization process so i just thought that was an amazing fact can i drill down a little bit on um when you find something that when they come in like fascism for instance and they say hey um we're going to uh use this word to attach it to them because nobody knows what it means um when you start fighting against that kind of stuff, do you just fight over the definition? Is that where you spend your time fighting? Or or do you fight over the the movement of the Overton? I mean, I guess you can do that by fighting the definition too, but what that's a tactic that they're using. And either way, it seems like you're kind of stuck in the mud if you're just fighting over the definition. Yeah, I mean, I th if you're if you stop and say, Hey, this is this is a simple definition issue. I think you've got the def definition wrong. You're going to lose, but I do think you need to fight because really what you need to fight for is the objectivity of language. Like that language can really communicate that that's a big part of the um, modernist and the postmodernist push is that language doesn't work as communication um, that, that you can't actually have real true communication. So that there's a uh, individual isolation uh, of each person as a billiard ball, and then they can be shifted around into the positions you want by means of course of power, by means of storytelling, or, you know, by means of whatever. <coughs> you dis they disagree on how to shift them around, but that there's just the interchange of interchangeability to individuals because there isn't a um, there. There isn't a uh, the, the with the modernists that the interchangeability is a an important part of the change in um, what would you call it? the change in anthropology? You know the way that we think and define humans, right? So you think of people as fa factory workers that you can just move around and put in the place that you want. There's some pushback on that in the postmodernists that come in and say, well, actually, that the human understanding is a relational understanding. Yeah, and yeah, there yeah. was some good stuff like that that just was, you know, it's just pushback because it's so untrue. Um, it's but, also scary. Like, I hope that's not the case. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, the, if, all the, the, if, if all of us together have decided and there's and then we are the source of objectivity. That's just power. That, well, and that's, I think that's exactly it is. And this is, this is why I think it's worth fighting for a definition um, is you, I, it's not pe a group of people can't just come along and say, we're going to separate this word out and decide it has a different meaning and and then push it onto everybody i mean you can change the meaning of a word that way but it's actually um an an a dehumanizing way of of interacting with language I, it, I, and this is why kamala's uh, uh you're, you're following her me. her phrase what, what is it un, un unburdened uh, by the past what can be what uh, yeah Unbur unburdened by what has been. By what yeah. has been. Right. Yeah. That's that phrase is actually 
it, it really is a philosophical justification for communism, right? It's you're we're going to separate from our history. We're going to, you know, uh, the the Western legal theory is a developmental legal theory, meaning that you take into account the judges, uh, the judgments of the past, that you build, uh, that you build judicial consensus by means of uh, argument from past judges uh, combined with the the principles of uh, of law you know, the uh, lex uh, lex rex the 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 law is above the king you know, combined you combine it together with all those sorts of principles of law and then it's a historical development process communism says burn it all down and we will build something new and whether it's by scientific uh consensus whether it's by the the genius of one particular ruler um you've got all different versions of that socialist utopian uh mindset but what they all agreed on was you've got to first disconnect everything from the past disconnect people from their roots disconnect people from their uh their communities you know destroy all of that and then you have just um you know the uh, the ingredients that you get to move around and put into the order that you want and then restart everything right that's a socialist utopian way of thinking uh and it's anti-human it's anti-civilization it's it's uh anti-reality yeah uh, um yeah, and another way to say it is anti-covenant because you're the the part of the first part of the, the statement is to um, think about or to dream about the future. Um, imagine there's no heaven. Yeah, right. That's what. It, and so the first part of that is to get you to dream about the future with with being unhitched, as Andy Stanley would say, from the reality of God's world. Right. What can be unburdened right that's the unhitching part unburdened by what has been as if you can exist some kind of way without the historical context right like that's what's so amazing about this and it's such a great i, I remember when i first heard that line I, everybody's kind of played it out now it's like oh what can be unburdened and so everybody's making fun of the fact that she said it a lot there's a reason she's saying it a lot and it really does resonate with a world that has no covenant reality in in uh biblical cosmology all you're right. thinking about is being unburdened by the past right like that, that's all that's all you, you're trying to be unhitched in some way well but and if you remember our definition of gnosticism of what we're saved from we're saved from our flesh but we're also saved from history right that hit we're so it's a it's a political gnosticism that says we've got the ideas that are going to rescue us from this historical grind that we've been in and mm. reestablish us on a proper a historical uh you know rational foundation or emotional foundation or whatever the new foundation is going to be um they're going to give it to us uh because they have <clears throat> seen what it is to be unhitched from the past or you know un unhindered by what's come before and you know that's all just gnostic promises um but people fall for it because of the uh gnostic assumptions that are embedded in the way we do everything um it's a we we have we have separated by separating from the historic church uh, the historic gospel, the the historic acts of God, we have gone into exile, um, into Gnosticville, right? and that's that's where we are. And so we're easily manipulated and moved around by Gnostic promises because we have we don't we already don't believe that the world is a unified whole that history uh, is moving from something to something that we're going from a garden to a garden city you know, all of the the eschatological promises of the bible have been unhitched from history already uh so when somebody comes along with more of more gnostic promises we can't identify them as um anti-christian mm, so then what would you say oh so there's two questions that, that pop into my head one of them is what is the gnostic promise and the other one um is uh 
oh, what was it? Um, history. Like when you say, like, I think a lot of people talk about historical church or the historical um, Christian narrative, but that's not always defined about what they meant. Um, and so you have a different reality about what you mean by the historical church, right? I, I want yeah. to two things, like the historical church, why that's important, and how does it deal with the Gnostic promise, and what are the Gnostic promise, promises? Um, I, so I think this, the the God established an institution with real jurisdiction when he established the church. And I, I think what we want to do is we want to, I don't know, spiritualize the church or I mean, you see it in all sorts of ways. So it's hard. It's, it's so common that we think it's a, it's actually a normal Christian thing to do. Um, so, <clears throat> uh he, because there was a a false or a i guess a, a bent or a crooked way of trying to establish uh the connection to the historic past um uh, and and uh the protestants said well no that's not actually how the connection works right so when the institutional church starts attacking people in the institutional church who are trying to teach the Bible, which is the the uh, institutional law book, the, the establishing book of the church. Um, the people try to teach it, and the institutional church attacks it. There was a a, a real sundering, a real rending, a tearing of the institutional church. Um, in during the Reformation, which there were a lot of heroic, wonderful things about the reformers, but none of them wanted to tear the church up. Um, the they were that was a that was not the intention, right? They wanted to reform the institutional, the you know, international institutional church, um, and uh, the institutional church rejected it. Um, <coughs> And it was, and it, it, you ended up with national churches, um, because the there were nations that came to the, to the defense of the church, or there were princes, maybe because the national national sovereignty was sort of about to be established. And I think one of the reasons national sovereignty um, ended up being established was because you needed. Uh, you you when you're fighting um when you're fighting tyranny you need other authorities to fight tyranny with because personal uh personal liberty rarely gives you the um uh, the justification for fighting against the authorities that God has established uh you so um Calvin called it the doctrine of the lesser magistrates, right? You you need other magistrates that God has established um, that will use their the authority that they have, the institutional authority that they have to oppose the in, as a check and a balance against the institutional authority of other institutions that have gone wrong. <coughs> well, when the Pope sent... <coughs> Sorry, my allergies are bad this morning. You when the pope right? <laughs> when the pope it. sends somebody to assassinate Luther, and the prince hides him and stands up and says, "Hey, not in, not in, uh, you know, not in my kingdom," you end up getting a lesser magistrate uh, check and balance situation that um, where the church uh, becomes, you know, the uh, the national. The national church or the church of that that small kingdom over against the international church as a way of protecting um, what the what the prince knew that his kingdom needed, which is gospel preaching. Right, he knew that we need the the gospel preached, we need the Bible taught, we need uh, and in, uh, we we need clergy that teaches the Bible to be safe here to teach the Bible. So. That ends up leading to the establishment of nations, uh, and then nationalism was uh, the you know, you see that uh, nationalism in France, you see nationalism in Germany. There were ways of trying to ha to have the nation 
uh, separate itself from the church or uh, establish itself without the church, right? All of the early nationalisms were um, worthy the movements away from a Christendom understanding. The, the beginning of the movement away from the Christendom understanding was when the Western church institutionally opposed those that were teaching uh, the Bible. Right? That was the beginning of the fall of Christendom. But the, 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 the kind of final move out were the different, different nationalistic movements that said, we're going to move away from Christ, uh, or we're going to move away from the church being a, a public established institution, and you can have your private religion, but no more public uh, religion. So it was, so it changed it. So it's changing its identity marker from, a, um, would you say a Christian marker of a nation versus a nation's own mark of itself or something like that? Yeah. So to a self-referential and it was different in different places. So <clears throat> in France, it was the language, right? We, all those who speak French, um, in German, that's what eventually what it was, was all those that speak German, but it was also, um, the, uh, an anti Latin, <clears throat> you, right. You had the Latinate culture. Cause it was like an anti Roman empire, uh, type of movement where so it was German, the German romantics, uh, talking about how much better uh, the German uh, religion was before the Roman Empire came in and ruined it. How much better the, the uh, germ, the, but, but this was happening everywhere. So you had uh, German religious, I mean, German, uh, German romanticism, you had the, the French linguistic movements, you, you had the, you know, the, the, so that's why, you know, you you can have uh, Napoleon feel justified of going out and conquering every place that speaks French. You had the, a similar sort of thing with the Russians. Well, they speak Russian. They're Slavs. You know, they they should be a part of our empire. Right, that kind of mentality that said we are a because we are a na uh, a a, um, a a linguistic group. We should also be a nation. Uh, and so the nation was being refounded on all sorts of different things rather than the the uh we were established you know god established us christ established us we're the, we are a christian group that serves the lord together and here's our history and here's when jesus showed up and here's how he's transformed us you know, uh, they began refounding themselves on secular principles on on what we would think of what, what you could think of as scientific principles things that could be scientifically verified um and eventually you know it it comes down to you know uh dna you know what it, that's that's who tells that what tells me who i really am um but uh but that's just the scientific advancements to get there you know um took a while to be able to identify all the way down to the dna even though you know it's uh, if a a human is a human and it's ninety nine percent of all DNA is in common, you've got just these little portions that are different. But the uh, that's the the I I think of it as the end of the road of this change to a what makes us us being instead of a covenantal reality, an institutional reality, a historic reality. What makes us us is now a something that you verify scientifically rather than something that you verify legally or covenantally or uh, uh, historically. And so when you say Christian history, those are the things that you want people to go back to, like you're, you're tying it back to this, the, the uh, covenant promise or what, how do you, what do you, aim yeah, I think, well, so you know, the, the covenant realities um of you know being baptized into into the international institution of the church the unified international institution of the church and it didn't it wasn't always and the, the church hasn't always been um a single 
a single organization, um, but it was always internationally unified in a way that it's not right at the moment. So, you know, I read Psalm 137 uh, this week. It was, and I was part of just my Bible reading. He came across Psalm 130 or hit Psalm 137. And it, he, they talk about, um, you know, sing us one of the songs of Zion, right? They're in, they're in um, exile, sing us one of the songs of Zion. And he, the, he talks about how much he misses when, uh, God's people could gather the way they were supposed to, and you know he, he's an he's an and it and and I, I thought of man, you remember back when the church was a public institution, and you could say, well, this is what the church says on these things. Here's what the church says about this this sort of thing. We couldn't do that now, right? You um, because every Christian, you know, I just. Um, went and watched uh, you know, uh, the Forge, new the new Christian movie that came out with a group of guys, and um, and and the the as Christian movies go, the cinematography was good, the acting was good, the um, you know the music was the music was good, all those things worked really well. But you have it's the story of this 19 year old kid who becomes a Christian. You never see him step foot in church. He becomes a Christian in his room. All of his interactions with Jesus are with him and his Bible in his bedroom. He, he, you never have, he never, he, mm. he, he never goes to church. Um, so you get a, you get one shot of him coming out of the water in a baptism, but you never see the sanctuary. You never see what's going on. You know, you know, you don't ever see the inside of the church. And the, I think one of the reasons they have to do that is because it becomes a fight. As soon as you show the inside of a church, uh, uh, everybody starts arguing, you know, uh, but also I think most people think that Christianity is this individual religion. I mean, yeah, I think that's, the, that's far the more. Most yeah, and it's it's not. It's a it, it's an institutional religion, and <clears throat> that I think. Um, and and so when I read Psalm one thirty seven, that my the the longing for the Zion um, that that I thought of and and felt was that back when the church was a public institution, right? It was something to be a part of um, when it. it it had uh, was anchored in the world as a an institution with a voice that you know if if you wanted to know what the church thought you could find out um and it's been the institution has been melted down by the gnosticism of modernism so then um, that's that's what i want to get to so then when you talk about the promise of gnosticism what is that that thing that's melted it down what is that promise that people are believing or the promise that's being told to them. Um, well, because Jason, what I want to do, I want to come back to then, like that uh, that institution that of the church. Let's say we have it now. I want to work through what does it then start to work its way into and fix it that's in our society that's broken, right? So I, I kind of so I'm getting to understand what you mean by the, the the institution of the church, historical relation, realities of that. Um, it's actual governmental structure and real influence in society. I want to get to even like its interaction with civil, if it has any, because it's what's really interesting is we got here because of the fact that you were talking about Kamala Harris is what can be unburdened by what has been. So we were talking about a political reality that somehow the church influences and uh, um, and she's obviously trying to disconnect you from that influence to be more um, gnostic if, with the promise. So, the, like, so let's first work through first the promise, and let's go back to the church, what it fixes, and how it relates to the civil. Yeah. So the the, the gnostic promise always is a promise that you'll be freed from history, from uh, from bodily problems, and from um, institutional distance from the divine. I mean, or from the perfect. 
So no but, limitations. You're not limited by your past, right? Yeah, you're, not, you're not limited by your present, your, how your body currently is. Like there's no limitations there. And then, right. and, and then but then there's no, um, that you individually become um, directly connected to the divine and become, you know, individually uh, authoritative um, in your relationship with the divine, right? So there is no authority uh, over you that you, there's no expectation of authority. You don't need it because you've got this direct connection to the divine and the divine is the all, all powerful and you've got a direct connection to it. So you become an instance of that authority. Uh, an instance of the active authority of the divine or some, something like that, right? You, you don't, there's not uh, any, any sort of institutional um, mediation and we, and Protestants hear words like mediation and think, well, we don't, there, there shouldn't be any mediation, right? We should have direct access to the divine, but that's because of how much, uh, Gnosticism has infected American evangelicalism. Uh, of course, there is mediation, right? We're, there's, an, I mean, there's an entire book where two thirds of it is about the establishment of proper mediation, uh, and the the whole point of the Old Testament was how much we need mediation between us and the divine because of our sin, uh, and. And that, but that God provides that mediation, and He provides that mediation by means of the, the man Jesus Christ, who is also God. Right? We need, we need mediation, and, and but it's and then it says, what does Jesus's direct uh, mediation in the world look like? Well, He ascends into heaven and gives gifts to men. And he and it's the it's church government, right? So his rule over the earth is a reestablishment of Adam's authority in the world. Uh, it, it's a reestablishment of a uh, an ordered society of an institutional uh, an institutional reality of the church existing in the world. And uh, his rule is by means of church government. His uh, his rule is by means of the sacraments, and his his rule is by means of the word. Uh, and so none of this is was a, a revolutionary idea or an understanding, but what came in was a, a, a gnostic understanding of Christianity that I could have that my that my direct experience with Jesus was going to be the authoritative, uh, uh, the, the, the authority, the establishment of the, of an authority in my life. Um, so all of the passages about submission suddenly become meaningless. Um, you know, all the, all the talk about the church and all the talk about pastors. I mean, you see people all the time, say well what makes you a pastor and not me a pastor right you know on online it is um ecclesi it's ecclesiastical anarchy out there and the and the online just reveals it but the ecclesiastical anarchy is every direction that you look um and it doesn't help that you know if somebody gets kicked out of their church they can walk down the street and start their own church. Uh, the, it, that's the, that's the reality that we live in. And it's a hard, I mean, the, the, the way out is spirit inspired mutual submission. Um, but submission is a bad word now, <laughs> even, even amongst, you know, Bible believing Protestants and Christians and, but that's because of Gnosticism. So did I, did I answer your question? You did, but now now connect how the reestablishment of the church through Christ has any uh, civil authority in that realm. Like how how does where does that because now I'm getting back to Kamala. Where does that now have its inroads into civil? 
issues? Well, it's so I, I think what happens when people talk about spheres of authority in their imagination, they have like three different circles that don't touch or maybe only overlap a little bit. Um, and, but the reality is it's circles stacked on top of one another. So when you say spheres of authority, it's aspects of a person's life. Um, it's not, it's not different things. I mean, um, it's, it's like, you know, you've got the sphere of the family. Uh, what's the family authoritative over, um, the producing of children, the raising of children, the economics of a society, or, you know, the, the, the um, the, uh, the, the, um, you know, if a, a family decides how their kids are educated, a family decides what sports their kids are going to play, right? How they're going to, how they spend their money, how they make their money, um, those, those sorts of things. Um, and the, uh, a, the parents have the rights to discipline their kids, um, in, uh, not, you know, not, but it, but if, but as soon as, if that discipline say becomes battery, which is the, in, uh, the injuring of a child, right. Then, then now you're in the civil sphere. Well, the civil sphere is stacked on top of the family. It's not like you've got this part over here isn't a part of the civil civil sphere that's in the family and this part that is right. The civil sphere covers the same people, um, but it, it has authority in certain aspects and not authority in other aspects, but it really covers the same space, the same people, you know, all of that. Um, and, but then it's, it hits its limits at the edge of where whatever civic covenant it's, uh, covering right so if you've got a uh, a city the city uh the city council doesn't get to tell you know the city council of yakima or of spokane you know doesn't get to tell um minnesota or or canada or you know iran what they can and can't do they've got a limited uh civic sphere um and, and then there's other civic spheres layered on top of those civic spheres, but it's over the same space, the same people. Uh, and then the church is the, um, is the cause is the international and intercosmic institution. It's the only one that crosses over, uh, all the other governments. It, it yeah, it covers all, all the other governments internationally, and, is what I mean, yeah, internationally, so, yeah. yeah. It, but it, it and, and I mean, I'm, I say intercosmically because, um, it's also all those saints that have gone before, mm. um, you know, the, the communion of the saints includes people that are in a in heaven, right? That that are, uh, that are before the throne of God, um. And the the authority structure of the church actually extends into the heavenly uh, sphere, right? So, um, and then it it extends over the sun, the moon, and the stars, right? Every time you sing the doxology, the church is ex is is uh, exercising its authority over the heavenly bodies, um, because it's it's saying to the sun, the moon, and the stars. Now is the time to worship. Now is the time to come to church, right? Whereas the heavenly bodies in the old covenant, they told us when to come to church. Now, um, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly hosts, right? Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We, the, the church, its authority is inter cosmic it's it's across this cosmos and into the other uh cosmos of of the heavenly places where baptized christians are up there and uh, and uh we we tell them it's time to it's we 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 the the 
the pastor stands up and says, now is the time to worship. And that's an authoritative statement that the world is supposed to heed. Um, but if, and the, the saints that have gone before do heed it because they are happy to listen and join us in worship. And you know, so, uh, the, <laughs> you know, the, the angels, um, are now under the authority, you know, you've got this <coughs> transfer of authority that happens in the resurrection from angels to men, from heavenly bodies to men. But it, and, and that's for the church, it says in Colossians, or to the church, that authority is established. Um, so it's in Christ, and then Christ uh, establishes his authorities. So um, and it's not a coercive authority, it's a converting authority, uh, but it's a real authority in the world. Well, those uh, established authorities, as they're layered on top of one another, the points that they interact are in the, in the, or at the people, right? Because the church doesn't have authority. It, it has authority over all space, but it doesn't have authority over the particular space that a family uh, has authority over, right? Their private property um, or the, the, national boundaries or the state boundaries you know it doesn't establish and set those things it doesn't have that authority it has authority over all uh, of the space but the shared authority is over the people so the church um, as it transforms people it, it transform it ends up affecting everything in every other sphere um you know i was talking to a, a missionary to uh, Muslims in the Middle East and was saying, well, what, you know, what are the sorts of things that, you know, you, you go through, at, um, in a, you know, in your baptism class and he was going, he's like, well, you know, a, a lot of the normal stuff. He says, one of the things we have to talk about is that you can't beat your wife anymore. Um, because in Islam that's expected Like you're a bad Muslim. If you're, <laughs> if you're not, um, you know, disciplining your wife by, uh, you know, beating her, around, you know, whacking her around and stuff. And we have to explain to them that actually you don't do that anymore. You're a Christian. Christians, um, you know, love their wives. And so he's the, so, and that, so that has an incredible transformative effect on the sphere of the family. It doesn't take over the sphere of the family, but it transforms it by transforming the thing that it, it has shared authority over, which is the person, the people. So, um, and so institutionally, the church has had a transformative voice in society. Uh, it, uh, it actually has authority over the people. Because it has authority over the people. So it can excommunicate the governor. Um, it can't remove the governor, but it can excommunicate the governor. And and now all of a sudden, all of the people look at the governor and say, oh, I'm being ruled by an excommunicated man. I'm um, right. It, it ha has a way of, of uh, diluting his moral authority. Um, and, and, and it really di did this throughout history. And sometimes it did it in uh, ways that were uh, wrong, right? But the the fact that that authority was misused uh sometimes doesn't mean that it didn't use that authority right in a lot of instances uh we we would think automatically i mean in the modern world we automatically side with the excommunicated without before we hear the story <laughs> that um and that but that's a gnostic that's a Gnostic assumption that uh, that if somebody was excommunicated, the church was probably wrong. Right. Um, the, that's right just now. It's so funny is that because <laughs> because the church is so messed up. I don't trust anybody's excommunication anymore, though, Jason. I don't I don't trust I don't trust them. I, I mean, I they and they have real authority. I know it. I get it. But, man, they don't know how to judge anything anymore. They don't know oh, how no, to, I, you know. I agree, but the principle of justice is hear both sides of the story before you make a judgment. I agree, and by the time right. you and, do, and we, have, yeah, we have a a gnostic leaning, and so we need to be aware of it, even when we're hearing both sides of the story. Yeah, I, no, I agree. I 
and I find more times than not that it's um, been in some of these situations where it's like it's kind of fifty fifty. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they're right, sometimes. But I don't. I think you're right, though. That doesn't remove the real authority that they have. Um, I think that puts them even more at fault because they really do have a real authority and they're handling it lightly. That's my point that I'm trying to make. And and so I, I think there is a judgment for that. What were you going to say? And then I want to ask another question. Well, I I was going to say there ought to be um, classes and seminaries on. Mm. Uh, justice and excommunication, but you, you're not. I mean, you don't find it. Well, I would just like a presbytery. Part of, I mean, honestly, there is no, no one. I don't think that in the SBC you can take your case before the Southern Baptist. There's no courts. Like, if you really do have a grievance and you you have been able to, we don't have any courts in the church anymore. Like, yeah, I mean, I should, it, I'll go somewhere some else. of the smaller denominations you do, but yeah, yeah, in yeah. the big majors, I don't think you do. Um, so there's no appeals process. There's no working through the system. It's like you got that one group of people and you, and you got to figure out how to get them to be on your side. And there's all sorts of manipulation because there's no real courts, right? Yeah, I, and I think that is the that's the <laughs> danger of, uh, of a an independent understanding right in in, in an independent uh church government is that all i've got is this congregation and so the especially in a congregationalist setting where you you know you've the the you're you're dealing more with a um democracy and you have to to basically politic to keep your um position in those settings and so yeah i mean i i there's i, I like presbyterianism for that reason i mean I, I would say there's a number of biblical options god organized the church in different times throughout the old testament in a couple of different ways so i think we, there are there's uh, options on how the church self-organizes um uh, but it, what I don't, I actually don't think independency is one of those options that's biblically justified, but that's a, a for a completely different um, so, time. Uh, but the what, but the church isn't just my congregation, right? You've got the so all the Christians in a city are the church, so any um church organization that you know, and any kind of ideal church organization should be minimally, I think all the churches in the city are somehow figuring out how to connect. I mean, that's, that's what we should, that's how we should be thinking. Um, we've, we've retreated into smaller and smaller subgroups so much that a lot of the public expressions of the church, uh, the public facing aspects of the organizational church we've left to the um to unbelievers so now you've got people that don't believe the bible running the public facing aspects mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. church and we like to and i think we think yeah but we're the ones that have the true real connection over here and so that those all that institutional church nonsense that's out there public facing that's not the real church we're the real church the problem is they are they're they're you know if if just like if you have if a Muslim, if a Muslim's writing your church newsletter it doesn't make it not your church newsletter right it's still your church's newsletter you just have somebody writing it with uh, that's that it. doesn't understand and and I think right now our the public facing aspects of the church um, we've left in the hands of unbelievers so that that's a really good point because. Um... The, this goes back to the independent thing, and maybe you've already made this connection, but I'm slow, so forgive me. But the independency, that mindset, that whole idea makes you feel like I don't have to care about what's outward facing either because I got me and mine and we're over here. That's part of that Gnostic disconnectedness from history. Yeah. Like, wait, wait a second. No, 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 no. They're speaking for us still. <laughs> 
<laughs> right? Let's not allow that to happen or have some sort of conflict so that it's clear, like, no, 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 no. That's, we got a problem. We'll be right back right after these messages, right? <laughs> That's, like we, I, I, the, go ahead. There, there's a reason that the Marxists said we need to get a hold of the public. Uh, we, we need to get a hold of the church's public voice. They, they actively went after the church's public voice. And the, and I, I mean, in most of America, they have it, right? The, the problem the, the problem with the Holy Spirit that the Marxists have discovered over and over is that the Holy Spirit doesn't need a public voice to be to exercise his authority. And yeah. so there's not you you don't start to you don't say, well, we got you, God. God can't we got your public yeah, voice. <laughs> yeah, God can't work without. Right. Not so me. over and over the public <laughs> voice has been stifled and then God the 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 word of God is powerful. And it is a conquering force, a converting force. And so wherever it's preached, it you know, it, it changes the world. So but there's the reason though why the judgment starts then in the house of God is getting all that cleaned up right away, you know? Yep. Well, and I think <coughs> that it's it feels easier in the moment to retreat when the the public voice is under attack. Um Savernola, I think, is a great example of this. So he was a preacher in Italy during the Renaissance. Uh, just a, he apparently had a very funny sounding voice, and when he first started preaching, wasn't particularly effective because he rambled and he get he would get passionate and talk. And uh, but as he as he uh, continued to faithfully preach the word, uh, the Holy Spirit started really using even. A, a man with a goofy sounding voice Praise um, God. because from me. because he was <laughs> right because he was passionately he would passionately open the scriptures to the people consistently well um the problem was he's in renaissance italy um before the real christianization of the renaissance so um early on there yeah, there was a a lot of these painters were using their skills uh, for pornography well the king's favorite pornographer gets saved by under savernola's preaching and so the king it gets upset and he decides he's going to uh he's going to confiscate the building from savernola because people were piling in and they were literally sitting up outside the windows to be able to hear the preached word. They were so hungry and the, the building was too small. And so he decides to lock the doors. And so he, um, and, and says, you, you can't have church anymore. And so Savernola starts preaching from the locked doors. He stands. And so now, the, but now the crowds are even bigger. Um, and they're, but they're, so they're just, uh, he, he just refuses to be, um, silenced uh and um and you know that there's the the story there's some sad aspects to the story because the um it was upsetting the church the church authorities started to get upset too like hey you know you're getting the 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 changes that you're that you're bringing to society um are making it making it so that people can see our corruption right so the 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 church had a public voice and it wasn't using it it was corrupt at that point um and savernola's preaching uh highlighted the corruption and the church uh the so that then the church authorities also started opposing savernola but he he wouldn't stop and he wouldn't stop until the um the the church authority basically you know excommunicated his whole city um and and he said, uh, I, I can't, I can't remember exactly what ended up happening. If he got arrested or, but they, uh, the, he, his, his preaching was so transformative though, that it was upsetting the people that were profiting off of corruption. Mm. And that, and, um, uh, and it, it's easy at that point to say, I'm going to back off because this is getting hard. This is getting dangerous. You know, um, but the you know, shining the light on 
on uh on the cockroaches and makes them scatter and, and if you if you then think oh no now the now the cockroaches are everywhere um th- this is a problem the reason that the cockroaches are everywhere is because you shine light on them um, mm-hmm. it's because they're fleeing uh and i think that's the the thing that the institutional church well so there was there was a lot of funny business. Um, Crossed fingers by Gary North is really helpful yes. in um, pointing out the funny business. And then I think there were, there's been a lot of of uh, Marxist uh, bad actors, intentional intentional um, you know donations with strings attached, and all sorts of things as well. That I think we've just got to become much more aware of and careful about. And um, <sighs> The closest one to us that that kind of the uh, would you say Jay Gresham Machen was probably within the closest? Yeah, it, on the on the Presbyterian in the yeah in the Presbyterian stream and kind of the Scottish stream. Yeah, Ma- so Machen, um, he he his book Christianity and Liberalism could be called Christianity and Gnosticism, um, but it, the word that he used to describe the Gnostic version of religion was was uh liberalism and but he's describing a gnostic religion right um and so and he says this is what's taking over the presbyterian church and they use like mission board funny business to get rid of him um and and it worked but it didn't stop him right he he just continued on in his labors but well, continued on fighting for the institute an institutional version of the church. Mm. I, why is it when those stories happen? One of the weirdest things to me, reading those histories, watching them. Why was there nobody else? Like there should have been a huge like the story should have ran, and Machen went out, and they said off with Machen, and then tons of churches rose up and took over <laughs> or there was a great going with Machen and it was amazing revolutionized everything like that's never how the story reads it's like there goes Machen and then a hundred years later everybody's like what happened <laughs> you know it's just like yeah shock. Uh, COVID was like I, our Machen moment you know what I mean like COVID was like wait a second something's broken so something's broken yeah and I, later? I think I mean, I think the biggest thing is that in the moment, it's hard to it, it's hard to understand exactly what's going on. Often, if you don't have, I mean, the the best thing that you can have is a real clear understanding of history. If you if you're filled with the stories of history, um, then you can identify the the characters in the moment. Um, I think that's a big important thing. Um, but then, you know, I, I think Machen was, he was on the tail end of a generation of, I don't know, it's not exactly prosperity, but it was numbness almost. Uh, and a, a big part of it was the respectability of having, you know, we, the, the training of ministers had been handed off to the university system um, and the respectability of a, of a European degree uh, outweighed the faithfulness to the gospel. And so they were continuing to send ministers, their best ministers over to be educated by the Europeans (laughs) and the Europeans had already fallen off the, cliff of faithlessness um you know so uh we we had all these ministers imbibing the uh gnostic modernism and then bringing it back to america you know and injecting it into america by means of the pulpits so um that power of the pul- the pulpit is powerful no matter who's who is the one using it um you know the, I, I, so can, can I ask you a question? Do you think um, something's going on in America right now? It's really interesting. I, it's a 
groundswell level, but it's still powerful. It's amazing because of the internet how small things can become impactful things in, inside of our political campaigns, inside of our our, our society. You know, it's, it's amazing. It really is amazing to watch. Those small movements have massive impact in 20 years. But do you do you think? Um, I don't like the either this or that, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. You can correct it. Do you think that we're going long after the wrong direction in trying to save America? And in, in that, if if we were just to spend the next 20 years, I, I guess maybe the question is, how would you look at with this current state of America and the unhitched by what has been, right? What can be, and yeah, um, what? What would you do in restoring the church as an important player to restore the society? Because I really do believe, and I agree a lot with people when they say that our Constitution really was made for a righteous people, a a virtuous people. And if you don't have those virtuous people, you're going to have a hard time. Now, their end to that is like, well, we have to write something else or put these people under some sort of master. So that's what they want to be ruled by. Let's give it to them until we can get them to be formed again into these righteous people. I'm not going that direction yet. I'm not convinced of that argument. I I, I really don't like it. <laughs> but I think that they have a point, at least in the idea that you, you're going to need a righteous people. You're going to need a virtuous people. And so I just think there's other ways of going about getting that virtue because otherwise, I don't know if you get back. Some places, when they go that direction, you don't come back out of that. Did Fran- I don't think France has come back yet, at least. No, I mean, you look at the Paris Olympics. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you come. So when you start that trajectory, I'm like, you guys seem to think that then now all you really are doing is fighting for power. If we can just get our guy in there and our power, then then we can keep our type of rule over those type of people um, until, you know, we cycle back around and we have virtue out of him. I don't think you beat virtue into people. <laughs> I don't think you do it. I think you have to have transformed hearts, right? Now, I think you have to restrain evil. There's no doubt about that. But that's one thing that the law can't do is transform a person's heart. I thought we knew that. So then we need something else, right? In order to be able to, why are you laughing at me? (laughs) I I love that. I thought we knew that. Um, I wish we knew that. (laughs) But yeah, I I mean, that's what, that's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing people say, and this is where it's really weird for me because as a theonomist, that's what people are usually hitting me with, with is you're trying to take people and make them righteous with the law. And I'm like, I'm just trying to make sure we have a judicious standard by which to judge things. How do we know we've reached justice? What even is justice? How do we ex- exercise it and execute it, right? What does that look like? And I think God's word is the best standard for us to understand and to operate within a judicious way that honors God, that doesn't bring the judgment of God on us, right? So then what is the, where do you start? Because it seems like to me it's more strategically and feasible to go after the church, but I don't want the society to collapse in the process. I mean, the the argument has to be over what is the source of a virtuous people, right? How do you get a virtuous people? So the the left um, has been because of the Gnosticism, the left has been arguing that it's by means of government education. Now, if we can't, if we aren't at the point, if you're not at the point where you can see that's not true, then I I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you don't see the, the outcome of going all in on government education, um, then uh, we're all in big trouble. The but it, but th- this is not the first time that anybody's argued that right. Plato argues for this, uh, and I believe um, in in Aristotle's uh, uh, political ethics, they both argue for the the purpose of the state is to form noble or virtuous citizens. Right, that's what the purpose of the state is. Uh, the but I just don't believe the state has that the power to do that 
I don't think it actually can do that. And so now that if, if that's the case, then what is the source of virtue? And this is why you are starting to see people flail back and forth because you have um, <clears throat> you because you have the obvious failing of the civic uh, jurisdiction to produce you know, when we gave them all the power they it didn't produce virtue in the people right and so you have pe some people that are saying well that's just because we weren't in charge if you put us in charge then we will produce virtuous citizens by means of civic <laughs> civic power which is coercive right coercive authority um and but i but as someone who says well actually i don't I don't believe the problem is who's in power. And if you give the right people the power, then we will get the civic virtue um, by means of coercive authority. It just, it just doesn't work that way. If God's law doesn't transform hearts, how much less are man's laws going to transform hearts? It's just, if God's law doesn't produce the, uh, that kind of, uh, you know, virtuous citizenry, I, I just have, no confidence at all that man's law is going to. Um, but now you have the argument going, well, is it produced by culture? Is it produced by DNA? Is it, per, you know, what, what is it, what ends up producing virtuous individuals? I think this is why you have, uh, th this is why you have people being convinced that white nationalism is a sensible, um, is a sensible argument is because they say, well, look at, let's look, just look at the stats. We're going to look at statistics and which group of people um, is the one that, that's the, that commits the least crime, you know, something like that. And they say, well, it's, we, if you divide it up purely, um, purely based on skin color, here's what you get. Skin color must be the source of virtue, or you know something like that. Um, though that kind of argument that's being it's put good, together, man. it's good. Yeah, it's, it's it's it is. You you see that argument being made. That's because the of the they were taught to trust in something that failed them. Right, one idol failed them. The idol of a statist, uh, a, a statist, or you know, trusting in the state failed them, um, and so now they're flailing what, around look what do you mean by that how's how did it fail there <clears throat> it has produced uh it, it's it produced you know the most maybe maybe the most divided uh moment in american history um there were there were a handful of places that were divided like this uh like the civil war um but we're, we're divided in a very similar way to just before the civil war Right. It's the same kind of uh, of divided div divided population. So, um, you know, and we were told that if we trust in the you know if if we put our uh, hope in the state that if that the if if we put our hope in you know uh, the democratic process if we put our hope in you know uh, in the, yeah yeah I there's all sorts of that. things pushed on us from the top that w we were told would produce. Um, you know, unity and harmony and virtue, and and it's produced uh, divisiveness, uh, higher crime rates, less safe, you know, less safety, and so they're starting to say, well, maybe it's the opposite of those things, or maybe it's, you know, may, maybe what we need to do is look at statistics, or you know, uh, or maybe it's a maybe it's culture. Culture produces that, and ethnicity is the source of culture. Um, and culture is an abstraction it's not a real thing so trusting in cultural transformation um or the culture wars or something i think is is um like you know telling a dog that the that if it can get hold of its tail um it can slow itself down or something i don't know it's such a, a strange way of thinking um but the that it does come down to though what where do you look um, how do you actually produce virtuous citizens if that's if that's what's lacking? And I think it is. Then you have to look at the source of virtue.